Hello everyone, it is Monday, April 20th, and we are back at History. This is the thing I miss the most doing with you, and I'm glad that we're back at it. Um, I have been reading some over spring break to try to prepare. Now that we see Woodrow Wilson up here, we know that World War I is coming. And so wars are something that are covered a lot in history classes, but World War I is one of those that... I don't believe that the United States does a very good job of covering very much as, as far as learning a lot about it. Um, so I've been doing um, some research to prepare us for that. Um, so we're going to get into that in the next few days. We'll be talking about World War I. Um, Woodrow Wilson is one of the presidents that I have been to his home. He His home that he moved into after his presidency is in Washington, D.C. It's on what they call Embassy Row. It's where a lot of the houses of the embassies of other countries stay there when they're in the United States. And um, he is, I think, the only president that made uh, D.C. his permanent home after he was president. He lived for about three years after his presidency, um, and but his wife lived in that home until she died in, like, 1960. 1961, I think. So um, a couple years ago when we went to D.C., we put this on our list of places to see. And so we went on the, the tour. So as I go through the slides, I'm going to show you a few things uh, from the house. But this is one, I want to remind you that this is something you can be looking up as they interest you. You can, and a lot of these presidential sites are putting more virtual tours on and more things on for you to see since no one can visit right now. So just put in President Wilson's home and it'll take you to that um, that site and there's lots of articles connected to it. They show you different things in the house. Um, it's a pretty pretty good website with a lot of information on it if you're interested in that. Okay, so on the first page, you've got his main information. I did add something here I wanted to tell you about. These are initials that are used for every president. So POTUS is a word that is used to represent President of the United States. So I hadn't told you that before, but I wanted to put that on here. That's not specific to Woodrow Wilson, but it is something interesting to know that POTUS is kind of short for President of the United States. Um, his years, 1913 to 1921, tell us immediately that he served two terms. He was a Democrat. He His nickname was the Professor because he was a professor at several universities before he got into politics. And then his Vice President, who was the same Vice President both terms, is Thomas R. Marshall. Uh, this picture here is some magazines that were in one of the rooms in his home that had his picture on the front, and I thought that was pretty cool. This, um, and they're sitting on his piano, which was the same piano that they took to the White House when they were there. Um, this, I love this picture of him because it does show him looking very um, like a professor. Um, and I don't know who did this painting, but I believe this painting is in his bedroom. Uh, or his wife's. I can't remember uh, which one this was in, but I like, I really liked this painting of him. This is his presidential portrait. Okay, now, if POTUS is President of the United States, then Philotus is First Lady of the United States. And here's the first interesting thing about Woodrow Wilson is we have Wilson wives and both of these wives are first ladies. Um, the first wife, Ellen Axon Wilson, um, they were married when he came to the White House. Um, she was a daughter of a minister from Georgia and um, she loved to paint, and she was from the South. This is kind of a funny thing. She was from the South, and she wanted her daughters to be born as Southerners. She had three daughters, 
and the first two, she went back down to her parents' home to have the girls so that they could be born in the South. The third one, I think, was born while her husband was professor somewhere, so she wasn't born in the South, but the other two were. And um, so when they moved into the White House, they had three daughters, and they were kind of um, older teenagers, so like 17, 19, somewhere around in there. And this is one of my favorite portraits of the four of them. This is Ellen sitting down there having tea, and this is the three girls. Um, Jessie, Nell, and Margaret, I believe, are the three girls. And um, I just love, I just, the colors in this painting and everything, I just think are beautiful. Um, and that was in, that's displayed in the home. Uh, but she was also an accomplished artist of her own. Before she met Wilson, she had done a lot of drawing and painting. She had actually entered some work into some contests and won. She had um, had taken several classes, and she loved to paint. But when she married Wilson um, and started having her family, she gave up really a professional art career to care for the needs of her home, to care for her husband, to care for her children. And um, she did still do painting. She did still enjoy painting and, and still tried to keep up with her art. But that wasn't the main focus of her life. Her family was. And she was very devoted to caring for her husband and making sure that he was supported in what he was doing. And then also caring for she educated her daughter some. She's, she was the one that taught them to read um, and gave them their early kind of biblical training. Um, and she was um, an active first lady. I, I hope you can see this down at the bottom. I think I have it cut off a little bit. But um, let's see if I can get that up a little bit. She was an active first lady, even though I think she is one that a lot of people don't know very much about. And I don't know if it's because, um, so she died in 1914. So she died just a couple years after he had come into office. And so I think maybe it's because she wasn't there very long that we don't really see her very much, and we kind of think of her as being sickly when they came, but she wasn't, and she was very active, and she, um, this says here, she was an active first lady who lobbied, lobbied means going to Congress and asking them to do something, she lobbied Congress to pay for slum clearance in Washington, D.C., so the, the slum, meaning the area where the houses were just so run down and so bad, and she didn't want to get rid of it because it was ugly. She wanted to give the people a better place to live. She didn't think that that should be where they would have to live, and she tried to bring attention to um, the people who were not treated as well. She also, one thing I read about her was that she had, uh, she supported some women who lived in Appalachia who made handicrafts, so like rugs and things like that. And she had some, she bought some to be put in the White House and then advertised them as being made by those ladies so that those ladies would get more business to be able to support their families. And so I thought that was kind of cool. It shows, it shows her understanding of other people and that she wasn't so self-centered. She was very, very smart. Wilson liked someone who he could talk to on an equal basis, and he did. He talked to her uh, like he didn't talk to anybody else. He talked to her about issues with the presidency and everything else, and she was free to tell him what she thought. And she wasn't necessarily bossy or pushy like I think of Miss Taft. I think of Ellen as a little bit more reserved, but yet very smart and very active, knowing exactly what she wants, but having a little bit of wisdom, I guess is what you would say, having um, some 
discretion, which means knowing when to hold back. She had a fall in um, 1914 and then developed, um, I believe, complications from I know Bright's disease, which is what President Arthur, Arthur died from, but also, um, I believe, tuberculosis as well. So she died, and even while she was dying, in the White House, she was asking other people to care for uh, Wilson while she, um, for her. And she even said, tell him later that it's okay for him to marry again, that I want him to marry again. And um, Wilson was so attached to his wife. They had such a, a loving and good relationship that he was destroyed. For days, he just didn't even know what to do. Like People that worked at the White House said it just looked like he was just wandering around and didn't know what to do. He was just lost. And as a citizen, that's a little scary. Because what have I said over and over? These are real people that go through real problems and real heartache. And you have a president who is going through heartache at the time where he is also supposed to be making decisions for you is a little scary in the perspective of the citizen. But it's also in some ways comforting that we have a president who is a real person. We don't have a robot that's, okay, you want to get rid of that personal element? Everyone's going to have problems. So it can't be a person. It has to be a robot. Okay, it's the same same thing with Jesus. Jesus came into our world and experienced the same heartache and problems that we experienced. So we could say, well, it would be nice if he could never do that. Okay, fine, but you don't have someone that understands you, that knows what you go through. Now, the difference between Jesus is he went through everything and never gave in to any temptation or never sinned in experiencing all of the things that we do. But we do, and the presidents do also. And what's interesting to know is right at the time that Ellen is dying, war is breaking out in Europe. Big war. This is a big deal. Like August 1914, she is on her deathbed, and he is dealing with personal, real, horrible grief. And war is breaking out, and he has to know how we're going to react to that. Whoa. That's a big deal. That's a little scary. Um, I put down here, this painting right here is actually a painting of hers. She got into impressionistic painting, um, which is very pretty. I, I love this style of painting. Lots of landscapes. Um, I saw one or two of hers that she did that had people in it, but mostly landscapes and flowers. And you can see some of those, that artwork on the side of Wilson's house. There, They had an exhibit that had a lot of her paintings in it. Okay, so she dies. The president is absolutely distraught. His During this time that she was alive, though, two of her children... Two of her girls start dating, and they both get married and have White House weddings. Both have White House weddings. And so there's one daughter left who's not really interested in marrying at the time. She's more interested in a professional career as a singer. And so she stays with her father and kind of is helping him through this time. And it was hard for her because she was going through the pain of losing her mother and seeing her father in this awful grief and not really feeling like she could reach him, like she could help him in any way. There were also a couple of other ladies there that helped during this time that were both secretaries to Ellen Wilson, and one was a cousin of um, President Wilson. And one of her friends was actually concerned that she was not going to get much uh, that she wasn't going to be able to have much fun being kind of stuck at the White House with this gloomy president who had lost his wife. So they introduced her to a friend 
who was, um, her name was, um, hold on, let me go to the next slide, um, Edith. And so Edith came with the lady who was the secretary, and they were coming into the White House one day, and they were getting off of the elevator, and all of a sudden, here's the president. It was not a planned meeting. It wasn't anything that they had set up. It was just a chance encounter. And she comes out, and the president is coming back from golfing. He liked to, that was one thing he really enjoyed doing was golfing. And that was one thing that helped him as he was grieving. His doctors um, and friends encouraged him to, to play golf because it, it was helping him through that time. And so he was coming back. He was in his golfing outfit, and they kind of run into each other. And the secretary, which is Wilson's cousin, introduces him to Edith Bowling Galt. And he was instantly taken with her. And this is about a year or so after his wife died. Um, Edith Bowling Galt was um, a, wid um, a widow who lived in D.C. Her husband had died many years before. They were married about 13 years. Or on the screen, I have 12 years. They were married 12 years, and he had a successful jewelry business. And even when he died, she helped make sure that the jewelry business was still successful. So she wasn't necessarily, like, running it, but she instantly made sure that it had what it needed in place to be successful. She put the people in place. So she had a good business mind about her. She she was a smart lady also. She was different than Ellen. though. She was not the same person as Ellen. But just like Ellen, she was very concerned for Woodrow and very a good help meet for him. Um, so he was instantly kind of smitten with her. He liked her. He She started coming to a lot of teas and lunches and different things at the White House. And... Um, after a little bit, they, um, his advisors didn't really want them to marry. They, they didn't think it looked good to the American public, but, um, and tried to keep them from marrying. But in the end, they did wind up getting married. And I think it was a good thing for Wilson because I think Wilson needed companionship and Edith, um, was good for him. Um, so this, this top painting is the one in their house um, in D.C., and this is of Edith. And then this is um, them together, and I think it's shortly after they were married, maybe even right after. Um, and you can see that, that they're both very happy, and I think it was a good uh, relationship for them both. She was a descendant of Pocahontas, kind of, very, very, very distant, but she was a descendant of Pocahontas, and she was proud of that fact, and I thought that was kind of interesting about her. Um, again, she was married to a man, and when she was married to Mr. Galt, they had no children, so she had no children of her own when they married. Um, he loved her company, and they married, they didn't marry in the White House, they married in her home in a very private ceremony. Only a few people were invited. And she was very dedicated to caring for him and traveling with him. And she listened to him and gave advice, just like Ellen did. Um, and he would often uh, in the evening be found reading to her, just like he, uh, he and Ellen would do. Um, so a few interesting things. Now, because she was a wartime first lady, Flautus, um, she was a wartime first lady. So some of the things that happened while she was there is she became a shepherdess um, by having sheep graze the White House lawn during the war. So during the war, she um, acquired several sheep and just set them loose on the White House lawn so that, because a lot of the men that cared for the grounds went away to serve as soldiers. And so the sheep would help with the lawn, but they also took the wool and gave it to people to make clothes, uh, sweaters, and things for the uh, soldiers. She volunteered with the Red Cross to help soldiers. 
um, she would often put on her Red Cross uniform and go downtown to the place where the Red Cross had their station, and she would serve soup and sandwiches to the soldiers that would come in. I read one story where the the soldier didn't believe that she was the first lady. It was kind of funny. Um, she knew how to sew. She had a sewing machine, and she made clothes for the soldiers. She traveled to Europe to Europe with Wilson when he went to the peace conference. Whenever he went anywhere important, she went with him. She was kind of like, she wanted to help him in any way. He liked her companionship, and she wanted to kind of watch and make sure that he was taking care of himself. She took her job as his helper very seriously, and she wanted to be a true helper to him. Um. Okay. Now, here's where she really did become a true helper to him. And this is why I chose this picture right here, um, even though this is probably before. But towards the end of Wilson's presidency, he has a stroke. He goes on a big tour of the United States to try to, to, try to encourage the people to support a plan and we'll get more into that later, but I'm trying to give you a little bit, to support his plan that Congress wasn't wanting to support. So he traveled all over the United States, and his it was already taking a toll on his health because of all of what he was doing with the war before. So he has a stroke. They come back to Washington, D.C., and he is basically not able to do hardly anything. And she says in her memoirs that the doctors were the ones that told her that it was very important that she kind of take over and, and decide what matters he would look over. They said his mind is still good. Okay, so that is important with a president, right? His mind was still good, but he was basically in bed. It paralyzed one side, and he was... He had difficulty walking, and so they said his, whether he lives or dies, is kind of in your ballpark. They made her feel very important in this matter, and you need to make sure that um, you kind of determine what he looks at, and that it's not too upsetting to him, that it's not too straining on him, and... Um, and kind of be the go-between. And so many people saw what she was doing and were very concerned. Many people called him the first man and her the first president, first lady president. She was called her presidentess um, because, and they were mocking terms, and she claims that she never did make any decisions that she, she tried to stay neutral, but yet, think about it, she was the one making the decision whether this bill would go to him or whether she would send it to someone else to take care of. That's an important job, and that would determine what he was able to do. And many people didn't know how competent he was. Was she putting the pen in his hand and making him sign things? I don't think so. From what I've read, he he had his mind. He had the capabilities to think, um, which means that he can rule. But he would get very tired, and he his body was not physically able up to the task. So she asked the doctors, well, shouldn't he just resign and the vice president take over? This is I, I'm caring for my husband, and I want what's best for him. They said, don't you realize that would kill him? If he has worked so hard to get all of this done and then he has to leave the presidency, that will kill him. That will put him in a depression so bad that he won't come out of it. And they're the ones that convinced her that she need, that he needed to stay president and she needed to kind of just be his the door between him and anybody else. If they wanted to see him, they had to come through her first which no other first lady had done before and since. So she played a really important role. Some people think 
too of an important role, but she played an important role. And then, um, so she cared for him in their home when they left the presidency, um, and and then he died three years later. She lived a long time afterwards. She had very important figures in her home for all of her life. Um, she um, was invited to the White House. This picture down here is with Kennedy was signing a law to plan a memorial for Wilson. And she was invited to come and be there in the, uh, during the signing. So that's a picture of her as an older lady. Um, okay, Wilson Personal. Oops. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. He was the son of a minister born in Staunton, Virginia, not too far from where we are. He became a professor at several colleges, including Princeton. Um, while he was there, he wrote lots of books. He wrote this um, volume of a History of the United States. A History of the American People, I think is what it's called. And I actually have a few of them, and I've read it. And he's a good writer. It's not too high. It's not too complicated to understand. It's written very well. And he did some writings on the government and what the role of the president was to be. And after that, he became governor of New Jersey. And then he eventually rose to be uh a presidential candidate and then we know that Taft and Roosevelt split their party and so one of them would have won but because both of them ran the votes got split from that party and Wilson actually won a majority um, because of his religious background he believed that being president was a call from God and he called it a divine mission and a moral responsibility. So he felt very seriously about this job as president, that it was, it was a calling directly from God on his life and something that he had to, um, to do a good job at. So I think that kind of um, view of it is very interesting. That gives us a little bit more of an idea about where he's coming from. He really liked the movies. Uh, movies were becoming more popular at this time. We talked a few times back about the first full-length movie of The Great Train Robbery. And so movies are becoming popular. This little, this is a movie projector that he had at his home. And he would view movies in his home from this projector. This is a radio mic where he did some radio addresses from his home. And this was um, a record player. Uh, old Victrola, and he enjoyed his family life. Um, he loved to spend time with his daughters and his wives, depending on who he was married to at the time, but family life was very important to him. Um, like I already said, he had three girls. Two of them were married in the White House, and he a uh, presidential first was that he was the first president to hold a press conference. He was also the first president I should put this on here, but we'll talk about it later. He was the first president to directly address Congress. So if he wanted something done, he took his proposal to Congress and actually presented it to them. And that was, nobody did that before. And he got a lot done. He got a lot done, not just, his presidency, presidency is not just World War I. Um, he accomplished a lot in his time. Okay, now I'm going to show you a few pictures from the house itself. Um, pause it if you need to catch up on the notes. This part's not going to have any notes at all. Okay, you don't have to write this. This is just my comment about this. This was a big tapestry that covered the whole entire wall in one of his sitting rooms, like a living room, and it was given to him from the people of France. Well, in a lot of older art, um, it was kind of a tradition by the artist to leave an imperfection or a flaw in the art. So sometimes if it was pottery, there might be a nick in it or there might be something. And what it was, was it was a reminder that only God is perfect. And another really cool reminder is that there is beauty in imperfections. So not, it doesn't have to be perfect to be beautiful. Now, this is from 
the tapestry. What is the flaw? I've had you look at it for a little bit. It's been up here. What is the flaw? It's not in the coloring. Okay, don't say the weird eyes. It doesn't have anything to do with that. What is the, there is something that is wrong that should have been fixed. Look at the feet. This is a foot and here's a big toe. This is a foot and here's a big toe. Now look at your feet. Is that the way your feet are? No. This is two right feet. <laughs> See? Your, toe, your big toes should be on the inside of this one and the inside of this one. So they actually, in the tapestry, on purpose, made this, it's a baby angel, have two right feet so that there was a flaw in the tapestry. I thought that was cool. Okay, this is uh, some personal things. Um, I This is all of his canes. Because of um, his stroke, he needed to walk with a cane. And, okay, so a president needs a cane, then everybody and their brother wants to send him one. So these are some of the ones that he was sent, whether he used them or not. You can see a picture here on his desk of, that's um, Edith, the second wife. Um, and his desk, the fireplace is here. This was in one of the most beautiful rooms I've ever seen. It was kind of, it has lots and lots of windows and it had flowers and orchids in it and it overlooked the backyard and it was a sitting area for them. And this is where their phone was. And this is the phone book, the directory. And look at how many there are. I think that's kind of cool. And then this was, um, they had a few people that served as servants and this was their um, intercom system in the house. And then this is his bedroom. So you can see the tray table and a, a really cool kind of artwork behind his bed. Over here is his shaving station. You see the mirror and then there's a long strip. And what they would do is they would take the razor and work it on that strip back and forth to sharpen it. They didn't have disposable razors like we do now. And that mirror is standing height, so he can look right into it and shave right there. Um, and there's Emma's face. <laughs> okay, this is from the kitchen. And I want you to look real quick as I'm talking because you can see some things that we still, that we use now. So we're starting to get more into a modern, what would look like a modern kitchen. Um, here's your big sink. You see ivory flakes, which are the soap. Um... Bor borax, some of you have used that in your slime making. He wouldn't have had that for slime. It was in cleaning. Um, this is an egg beater. You put it down in the eggs and it beats it beats it up. They didn't have the electric mixers like we have. Um, and there's another type of one. Um, and then over here in the stove area, this is a waffle iron. Here. And you see some kettles and a skillet. Okay, what is this box? That is called an ice box, which was their refrigerator. So you would have ice delivered in blocks and it would go in this and it would refrigerate or keep the rest of the whole box cold. And so it was called an ice box, not a refrigerator. You may know some older people that still call it an ice box. Maybe if they're a lot older, raised in the country. This was a picture of the pantry. I'm sorry it's not very clear, but I thought it was cool about all of the... They put canned goods in here of the labels that were accurate to the time and things that we would recognize. So you still have Heinz ketchup. This is Tabasco. This is flour. There's Campbell's soup. There's a, These are all Kellogg's cereal boxes, and it's things that we still have now that they even had the same kind of canned goods. The packaging has changed a little bit, but we still have some of the same things. This is the outside of the house. So um, kind of a grand entryway there. You can't see very much, but this is the whole house, and then there's a backyard back there. 
but you can see it's just a whole street of just row after row after row of houses very similar to this. And even they had toilet paper. I thought this was kind of funny with our whole problem with toilet paper right now. We can't get any, but they had some. And I, um, I thought that was um, cool. So it doesn't look as soft as Charmin. I don't know if I would prefer theirs to mine. And it's brown. Um, but I also got in here the picture of the box in the corner where you had a little hook and this just had sheets on it and that's toilet paper too. Instead of a roll, it was just in single sheets. I thought that was interesting. And this is another um, button for the uh, intercom system throughout the house. Okay, there's some information about Wilson. In your comments below, I want you to start thinking about World War I. There are all kinds of interesting, I'm not going to give you anything yet, but interesting jobs that you wouldn't necessarily think of having to do with war. It wasn't just soldiers that were required. There's all kinds of different things that you could do to help. So I want you to think about any questions you may have about World War I. It can do with um, jobs that were needed, positions that were needed. It can do with the role of women. Um, it can do with um, anything who all participated, I want you to give me a really good thought out question about World War I that I can start looking at and give me some idea of what we need to answer as we get into it. Okay, question about World War I. Go.